Earlier this year, Stephen Hawking died and his death was commemorated all over the world. Many symposia, seminars, many meetings to recount what he had done in the field of physics, particularly cosmology and black holes. Here in Lahore, I was invited to speak at, very, at many colleges and universities in the area, also in Islamabad. And I tried to do my best to, to explain what he had done in simple, non-mathematical language. So what example, what for example happens when you fall into a black hole? Does that memory of you get lost? Or does it remain in some form or the other? These are the questions that Stephen Hawking had engaged with during his life. He became the most famous physicist I would say of certainly of the 21st century, but uh, possibly of the last four decades. One of the questions that I would receive from the audience was, when will Pakistan produce a Stephen Hawking? By that I presume it was meant that somebody with his grasp of complex mathematics of deep insights into physics rather than his being a paraplegic who by an unlucky stroke of nature had been consigned to a wheelchair for so many for 30 years or so. Well it's not a bad question because after all Pakistan has produced many good cricketers, squash players, businessmen. We have uh, very rich people in Silicon Valley, for example, Pakistanis who have gone there, made it big. And there are, we have excellent actors, poets, musicians, but we have no mathematicians. Now, to, just to tell you what the situation is, we certainly have some very good engineers, we also have some physicists, a few theoretical physicists as well, and I could count maybe about uh, 10 people, maybe 15 who have tenure jobs at, at uh, good American universities. Not the very, very top, but at good American universities. Maybe we have another 50 or 60 who are at not so good American universities, and I'm talking about American universities primarily because they are the ones that uh, really are at the very lead of academics today. However, if I look around to see how many mathematicians there are, there are absolutely none, not even one at any Ivy League University, So not at MIT, not at Princeton, not at Stanford, not at Cornell, not even in the second tier of American universities. And at first, when I, when I went on the internet and I looked at the faculty list, I said, no, this, I am missing something. So I wrote to my colleagues in the physics departments because I'm a physicist, a theoretical physicist, I wrote to my friends, colleagues, and then even others who I didn't know very well, asking them if they were aware of Pakistanis who were teaching in mathematics departments and had tenured positions over there in even the second-rate American universities. And the answer was they could not come up with one single name. If you go to a typical American university website and click on the mathematics department, you will see over there Sharma and you'll see uh, Indian names, two, three, in every department, including mathematics, but the Pakistani names are not there. Well, unless we get to the bottom of this, I'm afraid there's not going to be a Stephen Hawking from Pakistan, not in the next 20, 30 years, but not even in the next 100 or I don't know how many hundred years, we have to get to the bottom of this.
Okay, so let's look at the mathematics departments that exist in Pakistan today. Were you to give them O-level or A-level problems, they would be scratching their heads. Now, they're all PhDs. They're people with lots of publications, and these days, you know, publication isn't a big deal. All you have to do is grind the wheel, and out pops a paper. Lots of them have papers, but now give them those problems which are at the end of a mathematics book, the kind of examples that you need to solve, and you'll get a deafening silence over there. So the sad thing, the extremely, I find it extremely sad because I know, like a lot of people know, how fundamental mathematics is. Let's go back to 400 years ago. There was, well, of course, there was the Renaissance that was alluded to by Taimur Rahman. Then came the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution. Why was the scientific revolution possible? Because of advances in mathematics and physics. Whatever you have today in the world today is essentially a product of those times and behind it all was that huge power of mathematics which people here by and large, I exclude a few who understand what I'm talking about, but by and large people don't understand what a powerful subject mathematics is. Also, how beautiful it is. Look, there is, we, we've talk, we know how to describe a beautiful painting or if there's poetry, we appreciate it from our emotional intelligence, as Temur said, but it is the exercise of rationality, of learning the rules and then learning how to apply those rules that then bring the power of mathematics to you. And in mathematics, there is creativity of, I would say, the highest order. Today's world owes to mathematics. Now, let's try and understand why we in Pakistan do not have mathematicians and almost no physicists. Well, yes, we do have one physicist who got the Nobel Prize. We don't want to talk about him because uh, of our religious prejudice. After all, our whole being is, is permeated by religion and therefore nobody can talk about Abdul Salam, the one man who got the Nobel Prize and yet one, and yet one who we choose to remove from our memories altogether. But let's go back to the ninth through the 13th century of Islam. That was the golden age of Islam in which you did have genuine creativity. You had great mathematicians. You had Umar Khayyam. You had Khwarizmi. Khwarizmi is the man who created the word algebra from Al-Jabr. Now this lasted four centuries from the ninth through the 13th and yet it ultimately gave, it ultimately gave way it then led to a sterile civilization which for the, now, for the last 800 years has produced no science, no mathematics, and nothing of any intellectual worth. Well, we had on this subcontinent a very great civilization. It, it was the period of Mughal rule beginning about 600 years ago. And the Mughals are people that we remember with great pride. They made magnificent monuments. They built the Taj Mahal. They built Shalibar Bagh, 
they built they built, they built uh, the, the red fort in Delhi. They built this and that and everything. But they built only tombs and mosques. They didn't ever build a single university. So when the British came, they came to a civilization that uh, was very satisfied with itself. And so when the first British traders came, at the time of the Industrial Revolution, and earlier actually, in, in 1600 and something, they came to Akbar's court and they showed to Akbar spectacles. And he looked at the spectacles, he said, very nice, very nice, can I get uh, a pair? No, not one pair, bring me 100. They showed him a telescope and he looked through it, yes, oh my goodness, the far off things look so close. But the Mughals never asked, how does it work? There was no curiosity. There was no attempt to create new knowledge. They were consumers of knowledge, just like today, we are consumers of what is made in other countries of the world. So, as the English, as the British, penetrated into Muslim society, it was the dominant ruling class of India at that time. They, they didn't come all at once. The British East India Company came as traders. They made inroads slowly, slowly. Now the Mughals were very satisfied. The rulers were very satisfied. Everything was going great. Well, except for court intrigues and so forth. They needed to run their empire. So they had of course, for that, some need of bookkeeping, not esoteric mathematics, but bookkeeping. They said, let's give that to the Hindus. So the Hindus did all the arithmetic, all the bookkeeping for the Mughals, and the Mughals, they satisfied themselves with, becoming, with being the rulers. They, they loved hunting, they loved uh, the darbars, the, music, the art, the poetry, and that meant that they did not at all bother with learning modern knowledge. So, 1857, the Mughal Empire crashes. By that time, there is a huge difference between Hindus and Muslims, which then reflects itself in the fact that all the civil service jobs, all the professions, the lawyers, the engineers were Hindus. And so effectively we became two nations at that time. Not two nations primarily on the basis of faith, but because they knew so much more than we did. And today, you see the effect of that. You see that they have gone to Mars They've launched actually the Mangalyan, which is now orbiting Mars, whereas we are limited to throwing up a little satellite, but that too with the help of a Chinese launcher. In conclusion, what is it that we need to do in order to have a Stephen Hawking from Pakistan? Well, the first thing is we've got to let our children develop themselves. We've got to free their minds from the, from the little hat that is placed on them. You know the Shadola Ka Chua? That's how we are making them. We have to take off that cap. We have to let them explore the world. We have to tell them that, the, that science is beautiful. Science is, is wonderful. Science has got depth in it, and science and mathematics go together. In the West, the best and the brightest don't go to become engineers or doctors or lawyers. In the West, the absolutely best students go for mathematics and physics. Unless we tell our children how beautiful, how powerful those subjects are, and unless we teach it in the right way, I'm afraid 
we are not going to get any Stephen Hawking or anyone even 10 miles away from him. And finally, absolutely finally, we now have to come to grips with the role of religion in society. The way that we have gone on and on for the last 70 years has brought us nothing but death and destruction. We need to become a normal country that teaches its young how to behave normally. And for that, we've got to have a clear separation between the religion that they learn, which should be at home and only at home, and the rest of knowledge they must acquire in the same way as any other people in the world acquire. Once we realize this, we'll be on the way up. For now, things are not going well. We see that. And yet, this is something that is within your power and mine to change. Maybe not in our lifetimes, but this has to be done. Thank you.